Welcome to this WiseL tutorial on iterating over loops using sequences. There's going to be three tutorials in this series. Sequences are probably one of the most important things in Python, and this is the first one. Here's what you'll learn in this tuutorial. We'll begin by looking at lists and tuples, two of the main types of sequences that you can create. And then what I'll do is show the difference between them, which is basically that one is mutable and the other isn't. And we'll look at how you can convert the data type from one to the other. We'll then look at ranges and strings, which we've already seen in previous tutorials, but they're the other two types of sequences that you can create. We'll then look at iterating over sequences using for loops, the theory, and then the practice. And then to make sure that this is useful and practical, what I want to do is look at no less than four case studies. So we'll look at one, listing files in a folder, another one listing out all the words in this quotation, a third one listing out all the built-in module names, and then a fourth one listing out all the hyperlinks on a web page. At any point in time, you'll be able to click on the link, which is, should have appeared about now at the top right corner of your screen, to get files to do with this uh, tutorial and also any exercises. But that, I think, is enough of me speaking. So what I'm going to do now is with huge pleasure hand over to my ever capable assistant Sven who'll guide you through the rest of the tutorial while I disappear. So let's get started. So we're going to create a tuple and a list. The tuple will hold the male friends and the list will hold the female friends. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is Friends, a sitcom which was wildly popular in the 90s, I think, and it's still running regularly on TV. Watch it, it's really good. So the male friends are going to hold Russ, Chandler, and Jerry, and I'll hold that in a tuple. And the female friends will hold Rachel, Monica, and Phoebe, and we'll hold that in a list. And what I'll then do is show you the difference between the two different ways of holding data. So I've created a file called listentuples.py and within this I'm going to create a tuple to hold the male friends. And comment says it all really. When you create a list or a tuple you can give it a variable name just like any other variable. So I'm going to call my male friends and the next character I type in determines whether this is a tuple or a list. What I haven't done yet is explain the difference between the two. So I'm going to type a round bracket in, and that means I'm creating a tuple. What I can then do is put all the items in the tuple in any order I like. I'm actually going to put Jerry first for no particular reason, and I'll follow him up with Ross again for no particular reason, and then I'll put in Chandler. If this has actually worked, I'm going to print out the value of my variable male friends. And when I now run that by pressing Alt Control N, you can see it gives me Jerry, Russ and Chandler. What I'll also do is print out the type of the variable because I want to show you that you're learning something completely new. When I run that again, you can see it says its class is a tuple. So now let's do the same thing with the female friends. So I'm going to create a list this time to hold the female friends. And I'll set unsurprisingly call this female friends. And I'll set this equal to, again, in no particular order. So if you are a fan of Friends and you're offended by my order, please don't be. And if you're not a fan of Friends, watch it. So I'll put Phoebe and Rachel. And what you'll notice is the difference is I've used square brackets instead of round ones. So I'll do what I did before. I'll print out the value of that variable. And then I'll print out the type of it. If I run this, you can see it gives me, for the second sequence, as it's called, it gives me it in square brackets, and it shows this is a list. So that's tuples and lists. What we'll now do is look at the difference between them. So whether you have a list or a tuple, you can refer to any item within it by its index number. And the thing to watch out for is that in Python, as in many computer programming languages, everything starts with zero. So in our example of the male friends tuple, Jerry is the zeroth element, Ross is the first, and Chandler is the second. There is no third element. 
So if I want to refer to any particular element within, in my tuple, in this case, I can do it by putting the name of the tuple, male underscore friends, and then in square brackets, I can put the number of the person, in this case, that I want to retrieve. Now, I've always hankered after being one of the male friends, so what I'm now going to do is show you how I can insert myself in the list of male friends tuple, why this won't work, and what the difference is between a list and a tuple. So that I'm going to add myself as a male friend. I'm actually going to substitute myself for Ross, who always annoys me a bit. So replace Ross with Andy. But I'm going to put a question mark at the end of that because I'm not actually optimistic this is going to work. So in theory, I can refer to the value of the second element in the list. Don't forget everything starts with zero. And I can replace that with Andy. And then what I'll do just to check this works is print out the value of my male friend's tuple. There's no particular reason why this wouldn't work apart from the fact that tuples are immutable. I'll explain that in a second. So if I try running that, you can see it says the tuple object does not support item assignment. So a tuple cannot be changed. Once you've created it, you can't make any modifications to it. What I'm going to do now is turn this into a list. And I'm going to cheat slightly by just putting square brackets instead of round brackets around it. That's the only difference I've made. But when I run this now, you can see it actually works. The second time it prints it out, I'm there as a second male friend in the list. And that is the basic difference between tuples and lists. A tuple is immutable, it can't be changed, and a list is mutable. Which kind of makes you wonder which should you be using. My personal advice is use lists all the time. Because what you'll then find is you can insert items and delete items and change items without having to worry about it. Perhaps the only time to use a tuple is when speed is an issue, but you're going to have to be working with a fairly large program for that to be the case. But in truth, it doesn't really matter, as you've seen, which one you use. I think there's just one more thing I'd like to say about mutability, which is I didn't actually need to do what I did just then. So I'm going to revert that back to being a tuple. And what I'll do is create another uh, variant of my tuple, which is a list. So I'm going to call this new male friends. And what I'll do is use a conversion tool to change my tuple into a list. Whenever you want to convert data from one type to another, you just put the name of the type as the function to use. And then what I'll do is pass into that my male friends function. Or my, sorry, my male friends tuple. On the next line, I can change the second element in my new fr male friends, which is now a list. And then I can print out the value of my new male friends list. So you've always got an option when you're working with tuples and you want to change them. Either change them into a list yourself manually by changing the brackets from round brackets to square brackets, or use the list function to convert the data type. Let's just check that works. So if I run that, you can see it's giving me the same thing. So, so far we've looked at lists and tuples, but there's four types of sequence, as they're called, which you can iterate over. The other two types are ranges and strings. So let's have a look at those now. We've already seen a range in a previous tutorial in this series. So for example, this one at the top of the screen begins with uh, the number two and carries on up to, but not including the number 12, going up by two each time. You can see the results of running the range at the bottom there. It goes two, four, six, eight, ten. And if I wanted to number these as items in my sequence, I could do so with these numbers. So it follows exactly the same rules as a list and a tuple. So for example, if I refer to the third item in the list, I'm going to pick out the number eight. A string works in the same way too. So any string of text like the words wise owl can be represented as a sequence of letters, beginning at letter zero and carrying on until you reach the final letter. And again, I can refer to any item in the sequence by its index number. So for example, the second item will be the letter S. So let's see how this works in practice. So I've created a file called rangesandstrings.py and I'm going to use this to illustrate the fact that ranges and strings work as sequences too. So let's begin with a range. 
So I'll create a simple range containing the even numbers, even though it's a very, very tiny subset of them. So I'll create a range beginning at the number 2, going up to, but not including, the number 12, by 2 each time. What I'll then do is print out the type of that. We know it's a range anyway, but that's just to prove the point. And then I'll print out the value of one of the numbers. So what I'm going to do is use the index 1, and you might like to think which number we'll get as a result. Let's try it, if I run that. And you can see it tells me that this is a range, and it's printed out the value of the second item in the list, because I used the index number 1, which is 4. Let's try the same thing with a string of text. So what I'll do is create a variable called wise underscore owl, which will hold the, na hold the name of our esteemed company, or at least part of the name anyway. So what I'm going to do is the same thing as I did with the range. I'll print out the type of this, which I know is going to be a string. And then I'll print out one of the letters. So I'll take wise owl and I'll use a subscript and I might as well use the same scrub subscript number one. When I run this, I think it will give me the letter I. See if you agree in your head. Let's try it out. So it gives me a string of text and it gives me the second letter because I've used the subscript one. So ranges and strings work in exactly the same way as lists and tuples as sequences, which has important implications for everything we're going to do in Python. Just one more thing to show you. Um, are they mutable? Let's find out. So let's start with a range. If I take my even numbers range and try changing the value of the second number, and let's set it to 17. If I try running that, I think you'll see the answer for a range is no, it doesn't support item assignment. So ranges aren't mutable. Let's run that out, and let's see if strings are mutable. So what I'll do is take my wise owl string and change the value again of the second item to, let's have a Q in there. If I run that, I get exactly the same message for this. So it turns out that the only mutable thing, or the only mutable sequence, is a list. All the others you can't change once you've created them. So before we actually do some practical examples, can I show you the theory of iterating over sequences? Let's suppose you have a shopping list. You want to buy an apple, a banana and a pear. It might be a shopping tuple if you like, it would work just as well. When you come to the supermarket, you might find the apple aisle first, and then you might pleasingly in alphabetical order find the banana aisle, and then the pear aisle. Or maybe you find the banana first, and then put the pear in your basket, and then only then follow that up with your apple. Or maybe you start with the pear, and then put the apple, and then the banana. I think you get the idea. In general, when you're iterating over, the sequence, over sequences, the order of the items doesn't particularly matter. What matters is that you process every single one of them. The command to iterate over sequences, or the syntax, is shown at the bottom. For every item in the sequence, do something. Now there's two things I want to highlight here. The first one is the sequence. So the bit before the colon can be any sequence. So it can be a list or a tuple, in which case it will iterate over the items in it. It can be a range, in which case it will iterate over the numbers in that range. Or it can be a string of text, in which case it will iterate over the letters in it. Those are the rules. The other thing I wanted to show is the item. The item is a name for your variable. You can call it anything you like. And what Python will do is use the variable you've created to refer to each of the items in your sequence, one after the other. The statements which follow the colon can be any valid Python statements, but typically refer to the variable that you've just created. So you do the same thing to every single item in the sequence. So the properties of a sequence, which it has to obey, are twofold. And this is really background information. All of this is handled internally by Python. It's just to explain what's going on behind the scenes. The first thing is that having processed one item in the list, it should know which item to go on to next. So it should have a concept of sequence, if you like. So once you've done the apple, it knows to go on to the banana. And once you've done the banana, it knows to go on to the pear. And the second property it needs is knowing when to stop, a very important property in life. So once you've processed all of the items, it knows to exit out the loop and run the rest of your code. 
and probably this is the bit some programmers struggle with, when, whether they're iterating over the lines of uh, a text file, whether they're iterating over the hyperlinks in a web page, or any other sequence, it's hard to believe that Python not only knows how to iterate through them, but also knows when it's finished, and it can then carry on with the rest of your code. So that's some background to how sequences work. Let's now do some practical examples. What I want to do now then is do four or five examples of looping over sequences. So we're going to do a couple for ranges maybe, and then a string of letters, and then a tuple, and then a list, just to get you into the swing of this. And then after that, we'll do some practical examples. So let's start with looping over a range. So what I want to do is print out the first 10 numbers. So I'm going to create a variable called first 10. And I'm going to set this equal to a range which starts at the number 1 and stops just before the number 11 and goes up by 1 each time. If I want to loop over the numbers in that range, I can say 4. I then always have to think of a name for my variable. I'm going to call it num on this occasion. And then I put in and then put the sequence I'm iterating over, which in this case is the first 10 numbers. And then I put a colon. Then I can put a comment, just saying print this number. And I can type print, followed by the number. It's that simple. When I run that, you should see it gives me the first 10 numbers. What I'm now going to do is to comment that out and do the same thing again. Just because I don't want to leave you an impression that you have to always use a variable. I could have just done this in two lines. I could have said for num in, and then I could have put my sequence in straight away, like so. And then I could have just printed out my number. Whether it's better to put your sequence in a variable and then loop over the variable, I don't know. I think that's up to you to decide. If I then run that, I'll get the same 10 numbers again. So that's how you can loop over a range. Let's now go on and do a string of text. So I'm going to create a variable to refer to one of my favorite quotes, which is, this too shall pass. A good quotation to say to somebody who's going through a bad time, perhaps. What I want to do now is to show each letter in turn. So to do that, I can say for I'm then stuck with the task of choosing a, a name for my variable, as always. So I'm going to call it letter, because I know it's going to represent each letter in turn. But I could have called it anything. So then I can put the sequence I'm looping over, which is a collection of individual letters. That's what a string automatically is treated as. And then I can print out this individual letter. So if I run that, you'll see it gives me this too shall pass as letters that out. So the next thing we're going to do is an example of a tuple. And the example I'm going to use is going to be the Wise Owl training courses, at least in programming. Ooh, might as well advertise a bit on this tutorial. So I'm going to create a variable called prog courses, and I'm going to set it to be. Uh, let's start with C sharp. We also train, whoops, we also train in uh, VB. We train in um, VBA, train in SQL, and there's one more programming course we train in uh, Python, that's it. So if I wanted now to loop over this tuple, showing the value or the name of each course, I could say for course, I'll call it, I could have called it anything, in my list of, or tuple of prog courses, and then I can print out the course. Now what you'll notice is I've made a mistake here. I haven't actually created a tuple at all. So what I need to do is put an open bracket in front of that list and a close bracket at the end of it to make this into a tuple. If I then press Alt Control N again to run my code, I'll get the list of our programming courses. Hopefully you're beginning to see how this becomes almost mechanistic. You always type in exactly the same syntax. So let's do one more example. I'll just comment that out. And the final example is going to be to do with the Teletubbies. So not only are you learning lots about Ty Python on this course, you're learning loads about English culture, although admittedly it tends to be 10 or 20 years old. So I'm going to create a list of the Teletubbies. 
So to do that, I need to put square brackets. And this time I'm going to use double quotation marks just for variation. And the tubby tubbies are, as any child knows in the UK, Tinky Winky, Dipsy, La La, whose name is probably spelled like that, but I'm not actually sure, and Poe, who are respectively purple, green, yellow, and red. What I now need to do is show the names of each of them. So again, I'm going to create a variable. I'll call it TT because I don't fancy typing Teletubby in again in my list of Teletubbies. And for each one of those, I can print out the name of the Teletubby. Run that program, I'll get my four Teletubbies. So hopefully that's convinced you just how easy it is to loop over sequences. What we'll now do is four practical examples. So this is a bit of the course I've been looking forward to because I can show you some practical examples. We'll start with one which lists out all the files in a folder. I'm going to choose this folder, but you can choose any one. I've created a file called example one listing files.py. And within this, I'm going to import the OS module. The reason being that I need its list dir function. So what I'm now going to do is to get a list of all the files in a folder. So to do this, I can create a variable and I'll call it files. And I will use the OS modules list dir function to return a list of files. And that takes as an argument, a string of text. Well, actually it takes four different arguments and I can use these arrows to cycle up and down them. But the one I'm using is the first one, returning a uh, passing in a string of text. And crucially, what it will return is a list of strings. And that means I'll be able to iterate over all the values in that list to show the name of each file. It's that easy. Now to set the path, the easiest thing to do, I think, is to right click on my folder in the Explorer tab on the left hand side and choose copy path to get the absolute path. And what I'll then do is paste this into my parentheses or brackets. But just before I do that, I will add in the letter R. And that means I don't have to put an escape character before each of these backslashes. Sometimes you have to put a backslash at the end, and it seems to have to be a double backslash, so I'm going to put that in just in case. What I can then do is I can loop over my files. And because I know it's returning a list of strings, I know exactly what I'm looping over. So I'm going to call my individual variable file, and I'm going to say for each uh, of the files I found, show its name. And to show its name, I can just put print file. And when I run that, it will give me a list of the files in that folder. So for my second example, we're going to list out all the words in a quotation. So let's firstly create the quotation. Just by way of variation, let's have something different. Let's have, um, if music be the food of love, play on, which I believe is from 12th night? I could be wrong about that. So what we're going to do is list out all the individual words. Now to do that, I'm going to create a variable called words. And I'm going to do something I haven't actually shown you yet. I'm going to split this quotation up into the individual words. Now I'll show you much more about splitting in a later part in this series of tutorials on sequences. But for the moment, it's enough to just do that. And it will automatically assume that I'm splitting it up into different uh, words. You can see that it returns the list of strings. So it's exactly the same as the previous example. So even though we're doing something completely different, the thing it returns is actually the same. And again, we can loop over the elements in that sequence to print them out. So having got a list of words, what we can do is just print that out. I'll loop over the words, printing each out. So to do this, I can say for, I tend to call my variables the singular of the sequence name I'm looping over. So it's just a convention I use, but I think it does actually work and make it clearer what's going on. So for word in words. So for each word, I want to print out its value. So I can just put print. And because I know the um, split function returned a list of strings, I can just print out that word. Now, if I run that, 
you can see it gives me the words. I've got a bit of a problem with a comma there after the word love, but I can overlook that if you can. Perhaps what I'd like to do is just show all the words longer than four letters. So I'll just add an extra refinement to this. I'll say if, and then I can use the length function. So if the length of each word is greater than or equal to, or greater than rather four. And if that's true, what I'll do is print out the word. You can see it's underlined the word print in this case, and that's because I haven't indented it. You can always let your mouse linger over a word to see what the error message is. Uh, has it suggested the correct answer? Yes, expected indented block at the top. So what I need to do is to press the tab key, and that will solve my problem. And now if I print this out, I'll just get music and love comma as the only two words having more than four letters in. So the third of my fourth examples is going to list out the built-in module names. I've created a file called example3-listingmodulenames.py and what I'm going to do within this is import the sys module because it turns out that contains the method or the function I want to use. So what I'm going to do is get a list of the built-in module names and we'll see whether it actually is a list in a second. So to do that I'll create my variable, I'll call it modules and I'll set it equal to sys dot built in module names. Will that return a list? Well, if I let my mouse linger over it, uh, maybe I have to choose it, it says it returns a sequence of strings. We're not quite sure whether that's going to be a list or a tuple, but it's certainly something we'll be able to iterate over to get one string of text at a time. So that's OK. So what I can then do is loop over the module names and for each one print it out. So I'm going to follow my convention I explained previously of naming this the singular of the sequence I'm looping over. And I'll print out the name of this module. And if I run that, you can see it gives me quite a lot of module names, uh, most of which I'm probably not interested in. So I don't really want these ones with an underscore at the beginning. I just want the other ones at the end. So I'm just going to put a bit of an if condition in just to filter out uh, the non-system ones. So only include ones not starting with an underscore. So to do this if condition, I can say if, and then there is a string method called starts with. At some tutorial in the future, I'll go through all the string functions you can use. There are many of them but the best way to learn them is by example as they crop up. So if it starts with an underscore, except that's exactly the opposite of what I want to do. So I'm going to put the word not in in front of it and say if it doesn't start with an underscore, then I'll print out the name of the module. And now if I run that, I should get a much smaller list of just the modules which don't begin with an underscore. And these are the built-in modules which are probably more useful. I have to be honest, I'm not quite sure why that list is slightly different to the one I showed you uh, early on in this uh, course. That is an unexplored mystery. So as a final case study, I'm going to show how to list the hyperlinks on a website. So I've created a file called example4-listinghyperlinks.py. And what I'm going to do firstly is make sure that I've got the request module installed. I have. It's listed there. Um, if you haven't already got it installed, as a quick reminder, what you'll need to do is type in something like pip install and then the name of the module requests and press return. If I do that, I'm going to get a message saying my requirements is already satisfied because I've already installed it. If that doesn't work for you, go back to some of the earlier tutorials in this series on virtual environments and modules. So I'm going to import my requests module. And within that, what I'm going to do is actually go to a website. So I'll create a variable which I'll call response. And I will visit a website. And the one I'm going to go to is a test website created to allow people to scrape websites and see if it's working. And what I can now do is look at the response from that. So I can test the status I get back. So if the response status code equals 200, don't forget the second zero, so, sorry, the second equal sign there because you're doing an equivalent test. So if that's true, what I'm going to do is uh, look at my response. So I can print out 
response.txt. And it will give me a long line of HTML. What it doesn't give me is a list of all the hyperlinks. So we have a way to go yet. So what I think I'll do now is to go back and change my if condition to say if it doesn't equal to 200, then what I want to do probably is to display an error. So I'll, I'll print an error message. I'll just say found or something similar to that. And then I'll exit out my Python routine. And the advantage of doing it this way is that from this point onwards in my code, I can be certain that not only did I go to a website, I got a response from it because I got a 200 status code. What I'm now going to do is to split that HTML returned into different lines. So to do that, I will create a variable called lines. And I'll take the response from my request. And I'll use the split lines function to split it into all the different lines. And as I hope is becoming instinctive for now, you can look at the split lines function and see that it returns a list of strings, which means that we can, as always, leap over all those different strings and do something to each one. So what I'm going to do for each one is loop over the lines, putting them out. So to do that, I can say for line in lines using my mod variable naming convention. And for each one, I can print out the line. Run that, you should see all the lines of text. The problem is I'm getting everything and I just want to show the ones which are hyperlinks. I'm going to make two modifications to this. The first thing I'll do is just to trim this line. To trim a line, what it means is removing any spaces before and after it. So I can I create a, a variable, I think I'll call it trimmed line. And what I'll do is apply the um, strip function at the end of that, and then print that out. Now, if I print that out, it will look a bit better to read because it's missed out all the spaces at the beginning and end of each line. But I'm still not listing out the hyperlinks, but I'm nearly there. So I'll just get rid of that print statement. If we have a look at the website for this, and if you look at the underlying source code, so if I right click and choose to view the page source, and if I search for angle brackets A, see is it contains 38, I'll just zoom in on that, 38 uh, hyperlinks. And I could go between them using these down arrow keys. So a hyperlink is denoted in HTML by an angle bracket A tag. And so what I can do is search for any lines of uh, text, which include this hyperlink. To do that, I'm going to say, if that text is in the trimmed line. Now that's an unusual way to write it in any language. I'm used to using things like index of or substring functions, but in Python you say, if one string of text exists in another. And if that's true, it must be a hyperlink. So what I can do is print out the trimmed line. And I think that's just about it. So if I try running that, you can see it gives me a list of all the hyperlinks. Now, if you're really intending on scraping websites, I'd recommend watching a subsequent tutorial, not quite written at the moment, but it should be soon, about scraping websites using Beautiful Soup. But that's certainly a good start. Pretty much completes this tutorial on sequences, or at least part one of three. What we'll do in the next tutorial in this series is look at slicing sequences before going on a third part to look at all the other things you can do with them.